Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, succinct questions and responses would be gratefully appreciated. And at question number one, I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work it is undertaking to reduce the rates of male suicide in Scotland in light of the issues raised in the Equality and Human Rights Commission's Equality and Human Rights Monitor Report for 2023. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government and COSLA suicide prevention strategy Creating Hope Together takes a targeted approach to reaching and supporting people who are at higher risk of suicide, including men. Through the likes of targeted work with partners in the West Highlands and Sky and the Changing Rooms Extra Time programme, we're continuing to understand more about what helps men to reach out for support and what type of support works best. Another key part of our strategy is building peer support groups right across Scotland as a way to prevent suicide, which we know works well for many men. Finally, our Gender Balanced Suicide Prevention Lived Experience Panel allows us to continue to benefit from the insights of men affected by suicide, and that's invaluable in helping us to prevent male suicide. Megan Gallagher. I do welcome the Minister's answer there because the suicide rate for boys and young men aged 5 to 24 is two times higher than that for young girls and women in the same age group. One of the recommendations within the report is that the Scottish Government should set a national equality outcome to reduce the rate of suicides among 5 to 24 year olds, particularly in males. So will the Minister commit to implementing this and what other recommendations from the report could be introduced? to provide support to boys and young men to prevent more lives from being lost to suicide. Minister. So I would agree with Megan that we need to be, with Miss Gallagher, that we need to be very careful about targeting our support for teenage boys and young men. But actually, when we look at suicide as a whole, it's a U-shaped curve and the highest rate is in middle age so we can't take our eye off every age group and we need to make sure that we have strategies that meet the needs of every age group and we're doing that very carefully we're working with partners as I mentioned the um, program in Sky and West Highland looks particularly at rural communities where we know there is a particularly high rate and people are susceptible we also have work going on in LGBT communities I'm confident that we are doing the right things. We need to do more and every suicide has, is preventable and every suicide has absolutely tragic consequences. So we will absolutely remain focused on tackling this issue. Ivan McKee. Uh, can the Minister provide any update regarding work that is underway to raise awareness about suicide and improve understanding, particularly in sectors that support groups, with a higher rate of suicide, including, as we've heard, uh, men and boys. Minister. So, in implementing our policy Creating Hope Together, we are working with partners who represent high-risk groups, like LGBT community and other known marginalised groups, on developing tailored approaches to suicide prevention, awareness and raising and support. We've already taken a targeted approach to learning, so that the workforce who are most likely to be supporting people who feel suicide are supported. And that's in health and social care, in education, in emergency services and third sector organisations working in local communities. We're going to extend this approach further into other key services like homelessness support. The community-based supports which we fund for children and young people and adults also have a focus on distress prevention and support and through our time-space compassion approach we've worked hard to identify and to connect services and communities that are already doing important work to support communities at higher risk of suicide. Question number two, Cocap Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to support the rollout of electric buses across, across the Glasgow City region. Minister Fiona Hislop. Since 2020, £62 million of Scottish Government investment has supported operators to acquire 315 zero emission buses and supporting infrastructure to serve the Glasgow area. 305 of these buses are already on the road and the remaining 10 will be by the end of March. 
The final phase of the Scottish uh, Zero Emission Bus Challenge Fund is currently live, offering a further £43 million to transform the market for zero emission buses so that they are affordable to all operators without subsidy. I thank the Minister for that answer. Electric vehicles do go a long way on improving inner city air quality and public health, as well as contribute to meeting the net zero target. So naturally, the decision not to award Strathclyde Partnership for Transport Scott Zeb II funding for a new fleet of electric buses has been met with disappointment. What support can the government offer organisations such as SPT to help meet their electric vehicle ambitions? Minister. So organisations such as SPT can contact the remaining lead bidders to discuss joining their consortia ahead of the deadline for best and final bids on the 19th of January. Uh, information is available from the Energy Savings Trust who are administering the scheme. I would also encourage all bus and coach operators and organisations to explore the range of information packs, how-to guides and case studies produced by our Bus Decarbonisation Task Force hosted on the Confederation of Passenger Transport website. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, with the budget announcement that there's going to be no direct funding for the Bus Partnership Fund next year, what's going to happen to the work done by the Glasgow City Region Bus Partnership and other partnerships to progress bus priority measures? Minister. So that's not necessarily a direct relationship to the rollout of electric buses in the fund from the Scott Zev fund, but the member will be aware that there has been progress on bus partnerships to help support bus priority lanes. I might add his Conservative colleagues in Aberdeen have been highly critical of the work and investment um, that's already taken place in Aberdeen to encourage those bus lanes. But I would remind him that we cannot have a situation where the UK government uh, ha introduces budgets such as that by Liz Truss and her Chancellor that decimates the public finance system and provides for a situation where there's almost 10% of a capital reduction at a time of increasing construction costs and come back to this chamber and ask for more money that is literally just not there because of his Conservative colleagues at Westminster. Question number three, Donald Cameron to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support businesses across the Highlands and Islands region. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Our Economic Development Agency for the Region Highlands and Islands Enterprise provides advice, training and funding to help businesses grow and innovate. It invested £20.1 uh, million in 272 small businesses across the region during 2022-23, supporting 478 jobs and an increase in turnover of £122 million. Our investment of £242.5 in the four city region and growth deals across the Highlands and Islands will deliver significant and lasting economic benefits for businesses. And the 2024-25 Scottish Budget ensures that businesses across the Highlands and Islands will continue to benefit from a competitive non-domestic rates relief package, which includes, according to the latest figures, 23,000 business properties paying no rates at all thanks to the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Donald Cameron. Last October, HIE's Chief Executive Stuart Black told the Economy and Fair Work Committee of this Parliament that a projected cut of 4.8% to HIE's budget would, I quote, affect its ability to work with communities at local level. Given that HIE's total budget is now at its lowest level in more than a decade, following a cut three times as great as previously forecast, does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise the serious damage this will do to business confidence across communities in the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, as our delivery agent, HI uh, will continue to make a key contribution to achieving the government's objectives through the support for businesses and communities in strategic economic development. And the budget provides investment of uh, almost £67 million in 2024-25 as the first part of the Scottish Government's commitment of up to £500 million to anchor a new offshore wind supply chain uh, in Scotland. And we expect HI to play a key role in delivering our ambitions for delivering 
strengthening the supply chain for offshore wind and maximising the economic benefits uh, there. Uh, but I and I'll also continue to work with HI uh, to ensure that they can prioritise the funding that they've received to maximise the opportunities available. But I really respectfully say to Donald Cameron that it's incredible. At the time when uh, our budgets are under attack from the UK government, that he comes here uh, asking for more money uh, and it doesn't come up with the answers as to where it's supposed to come from. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before Christmas, it emerged that the Lerbert Kirkwall Aberdeen Serco Northlink ferry service costs would be hiked up by an eye watering 8.7% from April 2024. This is obviously above inflation and it will hit businesses with increased freight costs. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider such cost hikes on the Lifeline service supportive of island businesses? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, obviously, we'll continue to work with CERCO Northlink to make sure that they uh, re provide uh, a sustainable and uh, a, a supportive environment for uh, the lifeline services that they uh, provide. I declare an interest having uh, uh, travelled on the Northlink uh, ferries uh, over the Christmas period in order to uh, visit family, and I'd be happy to meet Beatrice Wishart uh, in order to discuss the issues that she's raised. Harry Ann Burgess. I welcome the government's commitment to supporting business in my region and there are now more than 1,200 social enterprises across the Highlands and Islands, the highest density in Scotland and a third of all of Scotland's social enterprises are in rural areas contributing 88,000 jobs and more than 2.3 billion to the economy. Can I ask the Scottish Government to confirm what specific support can be offered to the growing social enterprise sector in the Highlands and Islands? Thank you, President Officer. We recognise the unique importance of social enterprises to business and community life across uh, Scotland's highlands and islands. Our Social Enterprise Action Plan recognises the different challenges uh, they face. The Scottish Government directly funds the Rural Social Enterprise Hub and social enterprises from highlands and islands can access business support from Just Enterprise, a government-funded national business support service. Uh, this is delivered locally, uh, often through partners like Impact Hub Inverness, uh, and since uh, April 22, uh, we have awarded over £600,000 of financial support directly to social enterprises in the Highlands and Islands through our delivery partner, First Port. Question number four is not lodged. I call Stuart McMillan at question number five. Uh, thank you, President. I also to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what steps it is taking to address the cost of living crisis. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Despite the difficult financial situation from the UK Government, this Government is doing everything it can with the powers available to it to support people and communities through the cost of living crisis. We are investing a record high £6.3 billion in social security benefits and payments. This is £1.1 billion more than the level of funding forecast to be received from the UK Government through the social security block grant adjustments, helping low-income families and disabled people with their living costs. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. And earlier this week, I visited Advice Direct Scotland, uh, which is funded by the Scottish Government. And according to their own stats, more people from my constituency have contacted Advice Direct Scotland for energy advice than from any other constituency in the country. And I do believe uh, certainly their outreach work across the country, including my own constituency, certainly leads to some of that increase. And they're also attending one tomorrow at 7 North John Wood Street in Port Glasgow. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's vital that people do reach out for support when they need it? And does the Cabinet Secretary also agree that in energy rich but fuel poor Scotland, we see yet another damning indictment of Scotland's place in the Union? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I would agree with um, Stuart's uh, ex um, assessment on this. Um, it is it deeply, deeply concerning that we see so many people still in poverty. That's why uh, the First Minister uh, made the announcement uh, very early on um, when he came into post about the Fuel and Security Fund because he recognised the importance of that within the limited powers we have to try and tackle it. But the vast majority of these powers do lie with Westminster. They have walked away from supporting people with the cost of living and particularly in fuel poverty. But we'll do everything that we can and that does include um, the funding to Advice Direct Scotland and others who provide such valuable, valuable advice to people at times of crisis. Paul Kane. 
Uh, one thing that won't help the cost of living crisis is slashing the affordable housing supply budget by over a quarter in real terms in the coming year. Anti-poverty charities like the Joseph Rowntree Foundation have used words like disappointing, brutal and baffling to describe the decision. Surely access to affordable housing is the bedrock of dealing with these cost of living pressures. So when is the government going to recognise that there is a housing emergency on their watch and take action, including reviewing their budget decisions which are exacerbating this cost of living crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, I would be more than happy to uh, meet with the member to discuss uh, this, as I'm sure the Housing Minister would, so that he can tell us in detail how we are supposed to deal with a 10% cut to the Scottish Government capital budget while still increasing budgets as he demanded. So it is absolutely within his rights, of course, to come to this chamber and ask for more money. If he wants to get into a genuine discussion about how to help housing and homelessness, my door is open, the Housing Minister's door is open, about where that money money would come from so we can get past the headlines and into the details of this. Yeah. Question number six, Claire Hawhey. To ask the Scottish Government how its budget will support household incomes in the Rutherglen constituency. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Part of our budget is a social contract between the Scottish Government and people of Scotland. The people in Rutherglen will continue to benefit from our long-standing commitments to free prescriptions, to access, free access to higher education and, of course, the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. In addition, the Scottish Budget commits a record £6.3 billion in Social Security benefits and payments to deliver on our national mission to tackle inequality and, of course, also sets aside £144 million to support a council tax freeze for, next year and protect, for this year sorry, and protect uh, household incomes across the country. Claire Hawhey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government's budget ensures that a majority of people in Scotland pay less income tax than elsewhere in the UK. And amidst a Westminster cost of living crisis, the budget will freeze council tax, as the Cabinet Secretary said, and increase the Scottish child pavement and also provide the most generous early learning and childcare package across the UK, saving families thousands of pounds each year. Does the Minister agree with me that the UK Government must now step up to protect incomes and they should do so by tackling rising food prices, mortgages and energy prices? Cabinet Secretary. I do agree with that. Our values-based budget prioritises what matters, supporting people through the cost of living crisis, investing in our frontline public services. Of course, the oversight and regulation of mortgage lenders is a reserve ma matter, and we have repeatedly called upon the UK Government to increase support for those most impacted by increasing inflation, interest rates and living cost. Uh, in June uh, 2023, Scotland became the first nation in the UK to publish a plan to work towards ending the need for food banks. This includes a a new £1.8 million programme to improve urgent access to cash in a crisis. And of course, we continue to repeat our calls on the UK Government to provide more targeted support for vulnerable uh, consumers. And this includes pressing for the urgent introduction of a social tariff mechanism as a much needed safety net for priority energy consumers, but which unfortunately the UK Government has so far chosen not to progress. Question number seven, Carol Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether it, its proposed budget spend increase of 0.1 million for alcohol and drugs policy, which is reportedly a real terms reduction, is sufficient to address the challenges faced in this area. Minister Elena Whittam. The 2024-25 alcohol and drugs budget has remained the same as 23-24. The minor change seen in the published 2024-25 budget is not a proposed budget spend increase, but rather funding being formally baselined into the alcohol and drugs budget line. From 2022-23 to 23-24, the £13.6 million budget increase includes an additional £12 million to deliver the cross-government plan published in January 23. The remaining £1.6 million increase covers portfolio for the operating costs for drug and alcohol staff, which was previously held centrally, and funding for drug policy has increased by 67% in real terms from 2014-15 to 2023-24, according to Audit Scotland figures published in 2022. Carol Mockett. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? There is some reality that we need to get. The Scottish Government declared alcohol harm as a public health emergency in its 2022-23 budget. And since then, we have seen the number of people losing their lives to alcohol tragically increase. 
while since 2016-17 since the number of people with alcohol problems accessing treatment has fallen dramatically. Is it time for the Scottish Government to stop tinkering on the edges of this and instead put forward a comprehensive strategy to ensure fewer people experience problems caused by alcohol and that they do get the support and treatment that they need when they need it? Minister. I thank Carol Malkin for that, que um, that question. It actually gives me the opportunity to inform the Chamber that in the coming weeks we will have a debate um, within the Chamber on alcohol harms and how the Scottish Government is seeking to address that. So I look forward to Carol Malkin and others participating in that debate with me.